All right, let's face it. AMD has been the butt of a lot of jokes when it comes to overheating systems or personal heaters in the winter time. I mean, even Anthony burned himself a couple of times when he was benchmarking reference 290Xs, but then Anthony's young. He probably doesn't remember the GTX 480. Anyway, the story has changed in a big way for our AMD, or is it in a small way? Um, the R9 Nano! Now, it's not every day that a manufacturer releases a flagship-grade graphics card in the tiny form factor. I mean, we've seen stuff like the GTX 670 and the 970 in mini versions, but those aren't exactly top-of-the-line cards. The R9 Nano, on the other hand, is, for all intents and purposes, a flagship card. I mean, yes, the Fury X is a tiny bit faster, but like, let's look at their specs. They both got 4,096 stream processors, 256 texture units, 64 ROPs, and four gigs of HBM memory. The only differences are a 100 watt reduction in TDP, 50 megahertz lower boost clock by default, and about 1.7 inches. Oh, and the fact that the Nano is air-cooled by a vapor chamber cooler. Yes, that's right. AMD managed to design a high-performance card in a small, efficient, and cool package. Not a sentence that uh, we heard last generation very often. I mean, so for you car guys out there, I guess it would remind me of something like a Lotus Elise. Sure, there are cars out there that have more horsepower, carry more people, or get better fuel mileage, but when you look at the overall package, there's just nothing quite like it. It's small, it requires just one 8-pin power connector, and it's one of the fastest cards on the market, not to mention that if you install it in a car in a case with adequate ventilation, since it doesn't have a rear exhaust cooler, it stays cooler and quieter than a lot of the other air-cooled cards on the market. Unfortunately, it's not all sunshine, lollipops, and rainbow butterflies. In order to achieve such a low TDP, well, there is some throttling that can happen. So the card under full load rarely hits that 1000 megahertz clock speed. Most of the time, it actually hovers around 875 megahertz in games. And as you'd expect then, it performs around five to 10% worse than the liquid cooled Fury X. But with that said, it's still enough to hang near the top of the charts, which got us thinking, how does the new generation with efficiency on its side compare to the previous generation where the solution was to simply pump more power? This is how I pump power, how do you do it? For keen viewers out there, you may recognize this system. It's the one that NCIX showed off at Otakuthon in Montreal. If you didn't recognize it, then check out the Montreal vlog by clicking here, <laughs> I tricked you. But as a refresher anyway, for those who have seen it, the system has an AMD FX8350 processor, 16 gigs of Corsair Vengeance Pro memory, a 240 gig Corsair Force LS SSD, and the ASUS Ares 3 graphics card, not to mention a fully custom EK Waterblocks liquid cooling loop to go with it. Seriously, this thing kind of reminds me of like Cloud Strife Sword. The Ares 3, which is a limited edition single slot based on the 295X2, has dual GPUs that are factory overclocked and have a combined TDP of somewhere in the 500 to 600 watt range. Now, fast forward to the R9 Nano. Even with two Nanos in Crossfire, our entire system actually has lower power consumption than the Ares 3, in terms of its rated TDP, by itself. So let's see how they compare in terms of performance. In Fire Strike Extreme, our Ares 3 scored between 9,800 and 10,000. The R9 Nanos in Crossfire, consistently over 1,100. Now, I know synthetics aren't definitive, but the trend did hold across games as well. So Anthony did the testing at 1440p and 4K in Grand Theft Auto V, Shadow of Mordor, and The Witcher 3. And there were some pretty interesting results. On average, the Nanos in Crossfire performed about 15% better than the 295X2. And while there were some concerns about four gigs of HBM not necessarily being enough, even at 4K, it never ended up being an issue in those games. So in the end, the R9 Nano presents an interesting conundrum. It's only about 80 bucks cheaper in Canada than a Fury X, but it does take up a lot less space in your case. In terms of length, I mean, most cases have enough room for a larger card. Anyway, it is slightly slower. It does run at slightly higher temperatures thanks to its much smaller cooler, and it is a bit louder, but 
I think we can all agree this is a step in the right direction for AMD. Smaller, cooler, and quieter definitely beats the days of just throwing more wattage at a chip and staying pegged at 95 degrees. Although the thing that I'm really interested to see them do is if AMD can build a single GPU card this size, then I really do wonder, where is our R9 Fury X2 at this point? Surely they can put another one on there. Anyway, thanks for watching and let us know, what do you think of the R9 Nano? And then after you answer that tough question, make sure to hit that subscribe button for more videos like this from NCIX. Click over here for more videos from NCIX or click over here to stalk us on Twitter.